because you're nomadic doesn't mean that you constantly have to keep moving. What about if my journey is not about a place? What else could it be? Maybe my nomadic lifestyle is about searching for it for an answer that I'm looking for. It has nothing to do with me moving around, but it's like, okay, more about within, you know? What else am I gonna learn here? Maybe it's about love, you know? Maybe I came here for love. Talking about love, um, Danny made this video last night and He's so full of love. <laughs> um, 55 seconds, he captured kind of the essence of what I wanted to do today. So whatever Danny is today, thank you for the love. My freshman year of college, um, the person that I loved the most that taught me about love and be loved, I lost. That person was full of life, passion. Passion for her creator, her community, her family. When I was 19 years old, I lost my mom. Oh, it's hard to talk about her. She taught me so much. She traveled so much, her passion was traveling. She would travel with my father, but my father wasn't a traveler. She was. I remember times when she would say, I'm heading, I'm heading to Peru. I'm heading to learn about the Incas. I'm learning about Machu Picchu. And I would see pictures. I was 10 years old. I would see pictures of her coming back, of her sitting with Incas, drinking cocoa Tea. If you guys know what cocoa tree tea is, the leaf of what they produce, the cocaine, but um, they have used it for centuries and years and years. Those things, those experiences were amazing to me. Every time, every Friday, we would go to McDonald's. I was born and raised in Panama. And every Friday, we would go to McDonald's walking. Six, seven years old, I remember walking with my mom because she didn't like to drive. She didn't bike either, but um, we just walked and talked a lot. And she told me a story that happened when I was about seven years old. And I, I do remember. She said that one time she was going to work. I was about three miles from my house. And she got off the bus and saw me walking three miles from my home and said, what are you doing? I never remember my mom yelling at me or anything like that. She never limited me. And that, I appreciate it. Because I am the person who I am because of her. I have no limits. And she said, what are you doing? Where are you going? And my response was, I wanted to see what was past McDonald's. Because we always get to McDonald's. <laughs> I was seven years old and I left home to see what was past McDonald's. We always get to McDonald's and turn around. I'm still trying to figure out what is past McDonald's. When I was 12 years old, she took me to a trip to Mexico to learn about the Mayan and the Aztec civilization. Hmm. This trip really opened me at 12 years old. I was climbing and visiting temples of an ancient strong civilization. I remember that trip clearly. So after college, I went up to work at a hotel in Philadelphia. Worked there for several years, three, four years. But I realized that my passion was traveling. 
And this job was not helping. It was getting in the way of my passion. See, when my mom passed away, just before she passed away, she always says, when I die, I'm going to die happy because I won't regret anything. I live life like I wanted to. And it always stayed in my head. I live life like I wanted to. So I said, I'm going to quit this job, and I'm going to find a way to follow my dream, to follow my passion. Somehow, between luck, blessings, or whatever you may want to call it, I got a job almost immediately working for agencies that would, I was traveling around the country doing travel um, event marketings, uh, trade shows. I was spending 10 months on the road, one month in LA, one month in New York, one month in Michigan and Detroit, um, New Orleans. I was able to see the country in 10 years, I was able to see every single state except Alaska when somebody else died. And I was going to the big cities, New York, LA, Seattle, Denver, but I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about this country. What about the small towns? I kept asking. So as an independent contractor, I decided eight years ago to travel by bicycle, to visit those little, little towns. So my first trip was from Vancouver, Canada to Tijuana, Mexico. It took me about 39 days. But to me, it wasn't about the time. It was more about engaging with people. And I always said, when I first tr started traveling, I wanted to travel without GPS. I wanted to travel like old travelers used to do, with maps, engaging with people and nature. Till today, eight years later, I still don't travel with a GPS. I don't remember about the turns that I did, but I do remember the people. I remember the environment that I was in. The following year, oh, and someone says, you're either going to love this or you're going to hate it. Man, I love it. I love it to the point where the following year I decided, you know what, I did the Pacific Coast. Let me do the Atlantic Coast. So I decided to go from Miami to New York City, through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, D.C., all the way up to New York City. I wanted to see more. But two years ago, I went from New Orleans, Louisiana, to Toronto, Canada. This time, I wanted to go to the southern states. And I wanted to travel with a purpose. So I decided to retrace the history of the Underground Railroad by bicycle. And I decided to start in New Orleans, Louisiana, at a place where enslaved Africans were being sold at a place called Congo Square. I remember going, prior to leaving this trip, my family said, do not go. Don't go on this trip. You're going through Louisiana, deep in Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky, Tennessee. Might not be a good place for you to travel, especially by bike and camping out. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I said, I'm still going to go. I need to see what's past McDonald's. <laughs> The fear that they had, I never saw it. I always asked people when they said, don't go through Louisiana, don't go through Alabama. Have you been there? Have you biked there? See, when you're on a bike, you're able to use all your senses. You smell, you see, you touch, you hear. See, when I travel by bike, I don't put music in my ear. I travel 10 hours a day with my thoughts. Hmm. I got a lot of thoughts. <laughs> and the good thing is that you go deep. And some people ask me, what do you think about? Well, I think about so much stuff. I think about what am I going to eat that night. I think about my mom. I think about my family. Well, when I like the most is when I don't think. When it's just I'm in the present moment. It's just me pedaling. 
People always say, how can you travel so many distance? See, when I look at the distance, I don't look at 2,000 miles from, New from Louisiana to Canada. I just look pedal by pedal. See, if you start thinking about the future, which doesn't even exist, it becomes overwhelming. If you start thinking about the past, it happened. See, you already have challenges. And when I say that, it's this. I was in a trip one time crossing the Pacific Coast Highway from Vancouver to Tijuana. And there were mountains that would take me up to four hours to climb. The next day, I could not think about those challenges because I got challenges today. And I can't think about the 2,000 miles that I have to go to Tijuana, Mexico, because I might as well just wrap up my bike and go home. That becomes too overwhelming. See, bicycle travel had taught me so much about myself, my human race, nature. I have so many stories, and we could be here till, for three days, me telling you all these stories, but I have, I have several stories and several examples of what happened in the southern states that my family were wrong. TV is wrong. The media is wrong. Second day from New Orleans, Louisiana into Mobile, Alabama, I ran out of water. But I saw that in my map. I could see that it was an empty road and there was no way for me to fill out my bottles of water. But I drank water. It was so hot. It was 95 degrees. It must have been 100% humidity. Empty road. I haven't seen any car pass by. My throat was drying so much that I had to start drinking my, my own saliva just to ease that pain. All of a sudden, this truck, big Louisiana F-150, maybe 250, <laughs> stopped by, passed me, and stopped. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is what my family was talking about. <laughs> yeah. This was my, what my family started talking about. And then all of a sudden, they started reversing. I said, OK, I'm going to get off my bike and just get ready. <laughs> get ready for what? I don't know, because I don't know how to fight. But <laughs> just get ready. Just get ready. They stopped. They pulled out the window. And I remember it was a lady and a man. The lady says, where are you coming from? We saw you 15 miles south of here. We were cutting some grass. Where are you coming from? I said, I'm coming from Louisiana. Where are you going? I'm going to Canada. <laughs> On your bike? I said, yes. She said, hey, do you want any water? We have a cooler full of water. I must have drank 24 bottles and filled out all my four bottles. At that point, I knew I was protected. Something was protecting me. My second day on the, on the road, and here it is. We call this an adventure cycling, trail angels. And there's so many stories like that along the way. I remember going to, towards Columbus, Ohio. Just south of Columbus, I ran out of water again. And to me, on those trips, it's about nature, protecting nature. See, when you are out there every day, spending night after night under the stars, you get to appreciate what Mother Nature is. You understand that this is my home. Yeah, I live on, a, on an apartment, but right now, for 40 days, this whole place is my, my, my home, so I have to protect it. How I protect it is making sure I don't leave any, anything behind. So I don't want to drink, I don't want to go to 7-Eleven, Circle K, to buy bottles of water. So I go to places like churches, temples, fire department, et cetera, et cetera. I, have, I haven't gone to Lowe's before just to get water. This particular place I was passing by was a temple, a Buddhist temple, Cambodian. 
I remember the, mon the monks. And I ran out of water and I walked in and says, hey, can you fill up my water, please? He said, where are you coming from? Where are you going? I said, I'm going, coming from Louisiana, going to New York, I mean, Canada. So they filled up my, water, my bottles of water. They didn't speak English that well. But I felt that love they had. As we fill up the bottles of water, I'm heading out, and one monk says, have you eaten today? I said, not yet, but I will eat once I get to my campground. He said, hey, we're having dinner in five minutes. Join us. See, when you travel by bicycle, it teaches you to be in the present moment. There's something here that says, I got to go, because it's 6 o'clock. I'm losing the sun, the light. I got to get to my campground. But the other side says, I've never eaten with monks. <laughs> All this is happening while the guy is inviting me. So I'm having this thing in my head, and I say, you know what? I'm going to eat with the monks. So the seven monks, we ate. As we were doing dishes, one monk says, where are you staying tonight? I said, oh, just about 10 miles from here. I found a campground. Hey, you're welcome to stay with us. Half of the mind says, the brain says, no, I got to go. I have to be in Erie, Pennsylvania by tomorrow. The other half says, shoot. I never slept with monks before. <laughs> so it is the experience that Bicycle Traveler teaches me. It teaches me to be in the present moment. So I slept that night with seven monks. And that night we talked about so much stuff. And when I left, oh, the monk, one monk says, you have to get up at 4.30 because we do chanting. I said, oh, that's okay. So I got up, and as I was leaving, one monk says, now you have the Buddha energy. And that was so good because I, it was so peaceful that night. Also, the night before, I stayed in the middle of some woods. So I, I didn't sleep well because I heard a lot of animals and stuff. But, but that night, I slept so well. And I did. I felt like I had a little Buddha energy with me. As I continue, several things happened between Columbus, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York. But in Buffalo, New York, I learned that there was history of the Underground Railroad that I was not aware in my research. So I went to Walgreens because my GoPro was, I didn't have memory, so I had to go get another stick. Get to Walgreens, long story short, come out and my bicycle was stolen. With everything that I owned. Not only the bicycle, my camping gear, my bottles of water, gift that I was given along the way. This particular trip, I really documented my feelings, the feelings of others, because people said, it's the Underground Railroad. It's a historical route. It's the Freedom Trail, documented. So it hurt so much that I lost my bicycle. Not the bike itself, but what it meant for me. And I remember calling an ex-girlfriend of mine at the time, and I said, oh shoot, my bicycle was stolen. She said, we'll get it back, don't worry about it. It's just part of the story. Part of the story, I said. What the heck are you talking about? I'm crying. What story are you talking about? I didn't understand then. So for two months, I mean, for two weeks, after I finished that trip, I went home. And I was dwelling, dwelling, dwelling on that experience of losing my bicycle. My bicycle, gift that people have given me. Two weeks, I wake up. And I go to sleep thinking about that bike. I said, there has to be a lesson here. I was on the Freedom Trail. So maybe it was the universe telling me, it says, okay, you feel free? 
Let me take this away from you. How free are you? Hmm. That was lesson number one. Lesson number two. Why am I dwelling two weeks about this bicycle when I had such an amazing experience for 31 days? I was 15 miles from reaching Canada and my bike was stolen. Yet I had 31 amazing days, stuff that happened that I'm still on cloud nine from that experience. I have to let this go in order for me to be happy. I have to let this experience of my bike being stolen so I could continue with everything I have learned along this freedom trail. I was able to finish that trip. Once my bike was stolen, I was hosted by a family um, that night in Buffalo, New York, and they let me borrow, oh, it's horrible. It was like a 1986 bike for a 15-year-old kid. <laughs> I actually got on the bike and they said, what are you gonna do? I said, I don't care if I have to walk to the border, but I'm gonna finish this trip. Because, see the people that traveled that same route that I was traveling on, they had hardships that were bigger than a bicycle being stolen. So who am I to say, you know what? This is where my journey will finish. I was paying homage to freedom seekers. I cannot stop here. So I said, yeah, let me borrow this kid's bike. I'm gonna finish here. It was 15 miles. I got on the bike, two miles into it, I said, this is not safe. <laughs> <laughs> this bike, it was noisy, I mean, it was a mess. But I said, hmm, at this point, it's too late. Two miles in, two miles back, that's four miles. Let me just continue. And I was able to finish my journey with somebody else's bikes. And I started thinking, again, about the lessons that I have learned. trust. These people didn't even know me, right? They lent me the bike. I remember a story too that I, I should have mentioned. When I was in Alabama, deep in the woods in Alabama, I went into a campground and I walk in, I, I ride my bike in. In Alabama, Saturday, football is religion. So there was RVs with Auburn flags, Alabama flags, and I walk, I ride my bike in. And the owner of the campground says, where are you coming from, where are you going? I told him the whole story, and he says, and I told him, I'm researching the history of the Underground Railroad. He looked at me and says, I cannot profit from what you're doing. So, Tonight, it's on the house. I mean, I almost had tears in my, in my eye, and I still, just telling you that, raises my skin because it's totally opposite of what my friends and my family were saying. The experience that I was having was opposite. So here I am on the Underground Railroad Freedom Trail, and I learned so many lessons on patience, on knowing that eventually I'm gonna get to Canada. But right now, it's about the moment. Pedal by pedal. Trust. The trust that I had on myself. To know that I could think of something and I will finish it. The trust that I had to, I had to trust other people. There's a story about a guy that I met my third day on my first bicycle tour from Vancouver, Canada to Tijuana, Mexico. His name is Bob Shun. I met Bob Shun in Port Townsend, Washington. 30 minutes into our conversation, he offered me a place to sleep in his house. That's my first time ever accepting the hospitality of somebody else that I never met. I actually slept 
the first two hours, probably with one eye open and one closed. I didn't trust. But I still went in there because there was something about this guy that 30 minutes into it, I could see that I could trust this guy. But I didn't know anything about him. See, traveling by bicycle teaches you patience, trust. Also, it teaches you respect, respect for other people. Because there's no way that I have, I have traveled over, in eight years, I have traveled over 25,000 miles. There's no way that I could have done this by myself. People had to help me for me to move on. Similar to the Underground Railroad where people had to help people to find freedom. But one thing that I truly learn about my lifestyle of bicycle traveling, which I will do till I'm 100 years old, is love. See, love is the only reason that pushes us. I don't care what hardship you're going through, the love, the passion that you have for something is the thing that just gives you that push. And I needed that push in, in some of the places that I have been to. When I was asked to speak about love, hmm, <clears throat> I said, I don't know anything about love. I'm not even in a relationship. And I started thinking of the attributes that I have learned with bicycle travel, which is like what I mentioned, patience, trust, being open, being adventurous, vulnerability, respect, passion. And when I started thinking about the things that I have learned, those attributes are the same as the attributes that we have. Their love, right? The love for our community, the love for another person, the love for our human race, the love for our creator, love for nature. When I started traveling by bike, I remember having that girlfriend that said, this is kind of selfish of your part. How can you leave for 40 days? What about if something happens to you? What would I do? I didn't know what she was talking about, but I just knew deep inside that I had to go out. She kept saying selfish, selfish, selfish. And it stayed in my head. And years later, I learned it wasn't selfish. It was self-compassion, self-love. I could not be in the place that I am today if it wasn't for those eight years that I went through what she called selfish. It wasn't. See, one thing that people don't know, I own Bicycle Now My Cafe. It's inside the Velo. So when they asked me to speak about love, all these thoughts kept coming to my head. And I said, wow, how did they know? Why did they pick me to speak about love? They don't even know half of my story. So a lot of people don't know that, but I'm going to share something with you guys. I came to Phoenix because I fell in love with a woman years ago, and she wanted me to move here. And at the time, I couldn't. I had contracts with, with, with companies. Uh, I couldn't find a job in, in Phoenix. So we split, but she stayed in my head. And I said, I'm going to go back to Phoenix. That was a year later. I'm going to go back to Phoenix and I'm going to create my own job. This is a person who thought, who two years ago had told me, are you obsessed with the bike? <laughs> and I wasn't able to answer her at that point. Am I obsessed with the bike? Two years later, I'm able to answer to her that it has nothing to do with the bike. See, the bike is my inner peace. The bike has connected me to beautiful people, communities, 
I learned about love. She's not here today. She's somewhere. She still lives in Phoenix. So I came back to Phoenix, and I was like, I'm going to find this woman. And I couldn't find a job, so I'm going to create my own job. So I walked in to Jason's at the Velo, who is the owner, and I said, I walked in, looked at the space, and I said, wow, this is it. I said, who's the owner here? I walked into that place just to look at some bicycles, and the thing turned around to where I'm like, I fell in love with the space. And I asked Jason, hey, can I rent this spot? I needed an opportunity to create, to produce an income. He looked at me like I was crazy. He looked at me like I had three eyes, which I do, but he can see one. <laughs> and he says, this place is not for rent. Hmm. I said, okay, that's okay. I'll look somewhere else. And all of a sudden, he turned back and said, whoa, hold on. Tell me your vision. He said, I would like a place for community. For people that ride bikes, could hang out here. Talk about bikes. I want to offer healthy snacks, this, blah, 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 blah. I was trying to sell him a dream, my dream. At that point, he turned around and says, I'm not going to tell you yes or no at this point, but let's keep in touch. Guess what, guys? A month and a half later, he called me and says, hey, are you still interested in this spot? And I say, yes. He said, let's make this happen. I finished my last contract, didn't take any contract, and I moved everything back to Phoenix, a place that I really wasn't in my radar. I have no family here. Well, now I do, my community. I'm not with that woman anymore. It never was. When I came back, she was with somebody else. But what I did learn is that love pushed me. She came to my coffee shop one time and said, I'm so sorry. but I'm with somebody else. At that point, something came in my, in my head and said, it's okay, hey, shoot. Now I own a coffee shop downtown Phoenix <laughs> because of the love that I have for you. So she was just a catalyst to bring me into town. She literally disappeared like those people that disappear on that truck in Louisiana. For me, she was a trail angel. She brought me to a place where I was hungry for, community. So, to answer her question is, this thing here has nothing to do with the bike. Again, it's about my inner peace. So I, I'm gonna leave you this with you today. And thank you for inviting me. But what are you going to do today, this week, to invest on your self-love? That's where everything starts. If you don't have that self-love, how can you respect nature? How can you respect another, another human being? Sorry. One of the reasons I don't watch TV because it's all a lie. People are truly kind and compassionate. All that stuff that's happening today, they're trying to divide us. I lived the real world. That is made up. Don't fall for that shit. Thank you. Yeah. They're just dreams. 
that I have created in my mind from the first one. Two trips that I have to do before I pass away. I'd like to ride from the US to Panama. I want to learn more about the people that live in Central America. I want to learn what I've learned with my mom when I was 12 years old. I want to go through Mexico and experience the Mayan, the Aztec civilization. I have a connection with those people and I want to learn more. But I want to do it slowly. I don't want to fly there and fly back. I want to sit down with shamans. I want to sit down with healers. I want to, I want to learn more. I still want to know what's past McDonald's. The other trip that I have in my head is from Cairo to South Africa through the Eastern Africa. And those two trips that I know I have to complete in order for me to move on. Yeah. So yeah, I do have plenty of trips in my head. Oh, Cuba, uh, 2017, maybe 2018, I was just invited to take a group around the island of Cuba. Um, so we're working on that as well. Yeah. Um, in the past, first of all, people called me crazy. So they didn't, they, they didn't trust me. You know, who was going to go, hey, yeah, I'll go with you, right? They didn't know that you could go from one end of the country to another end just by visualizing it. So I go by myself. Plus, another, a lot of people don't, did not have that liberty of having 30 days, 40 days, 50 days off. So that was one of the reasons I, was, um, I had to go by myself, which, um, which is good. See, when you travel with people, everybody has a dis different agenda, right? So I was able to, to use these trips to really go within. And that was what I learned on all these trips. It was always about going within, really deep in the roots. And if I was out there talking to somebody or camping out with someone, I would not be able to listen to my soul. See, and when you travel 10 hours a day, <laughs> you got to listen to it. You have no other option. So, by myself. But now, it's about community, it's about service. See, eight years, I told people, it was all about me. It's about self-love. Now, one of the things that people told me on the last Freedom Trail, as they would do things for me, they were like, oh, let me buy you an iced tea. Or let me, let me buy you dinner. Or let me do this, and let me do, I didn't, at first, I didn't want to take that. Because I have my own money. I saved it. I didn't need anybody else. Over and over and over and over through the Freedom Trail, people said, just pay it forward. Pay it forward. And it was almost like a theme. Shoot, now I got to pay it forward. And I, ha I owe a lot. <laughs> so now um, through, ah, life is so great. Now I have a coffee shop inside a bike shop. You can't write that, right? And it's a platform now that I have to be part of the community. When I, had, when I opened a coffee shop, I really wanted to be part of the community. So what I did is I created uh, with um, Phoenix Spokespeople, which is an advocacy group here in Phoenix. Um, we do a social ride the second Saturday of every month where we go around Phoenix 15 to 20 miles. Right now, because of the summer, we're doing about 12 miles, 14 miles. But we take, people to, we take people to places that they have not seen Phoenix before. People that have lived here for 15, 20 years have not seen the stuff that we, because through the bicycle, you see things a lot different. And, um, and I'm so grateful that I have that opportunity. The second Saturday of every month, I take people around Phoenix. We go to Rio Salado um, Habitat. Uh, we did one time a mural ride where we went to see different murals, arts, sculptures. My, my hope is that I know that I didn't come to Phoenix just to make coffee. I love making coffee, and it's paying my bills. <laughs> see, my mom was a social worker, so for me, it's very important to give back. When I see kids not on bikes anymore, it hurts me. 
So my hope is to work with kids from the inner city, from communities that are not being served, and provide bicycles for them. I want them to see what's past McDonald's. I want them to see what the bicycle could do for a kid. It's freedom, right? So I know that I came for that. Yeah, to do more than coffee. <laughs> At first, I was just traveling. It was just my space. But my family was really worried. And they were like, get on Facebook, get on Instagram. Please share, make sure that you post every single day. See, I will be in places where there was no reception. So for my family in Panama, my dad lives in Austin, so he wanted to make sure that I was okay. So I would... Um, post stuff on Facebook, on Instagram. It's interesting how life goes, because I kept, for three years I traveled without documenting anything, and then I got into Instagram. And I know for a fact, and I know that a lot of people say, oh, I don't like social media and this and that. But I was being able to use social media to inspire kids. I get emails, texts of kids I got an email last week from a guy who says, I recently got married. I'm 300 pounds, and the only reason I got a bike is because of you. Hmm. I only did it for me to, to experience me, but I've been able to touch other people, and that is the reason of my tears. On that trip around the Underground Railroad, I was documenting by hand my feelings. See, well, because I was traveling a route that the freedom seekers were traveling north to Canada. I kept asking myself, why am I doing this trip? I'm not from here. I have no part of this slavery and this and that. I'm from Panama. And I kept asking myself that question, and I know that my ethnic makeup is not it's as diverse as this, as this country. You know, I'm indigenous, I'm Spanish, I'm African. So I knew there was a purpose of me traveling, you know. So I wanted to document everything, everything. People say, oh, we're going to do a documentary. We're, no, 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 no. Huh? We're not doing anything. Let me just finish this trip. And if anything happens, it happened organically. So interesting that people want to do this, do, do that. A friend of mine said, don't do it till next year because next year we'll get sponsorship and this and that. I'm like, I don't know if next year I'm married, I have kids, and I can't do this. I have to do it now. And I'm so glad that I did because now I have a coffee shop and I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but so interesting that I lost that bike and people want to do all this project and all this stuff and all this stuff and... You know, when that bike was stolen, I always said, hmm, and this is probably part of ego, and I said, whoever stole that bike cannot ride it like I ride it. <laughs> <laughs> because that bike was built to cross country. That bike was built to, for that trip that I was going to do to Panama. It was built by, they welded, they took measurements on my arms, my legs, my torso, and they built this machine. I said, they can't ride it like I ride it. And whatever they stole, they just stole material things. Because see, whatever I move to the next world, wherever I go, I take my experiences. So my document, I, I told you all this stuff, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> so how I document it is through here, you know, and being able to share that with you guys. So I don't need anything else. Oh, there were so many. I mean, it's 2,100 miles from, from New Orleans, Louisiana to Canada. Um, 
that experience where, where my throat was really, really dry. I never felt that before. Um, another experience was, and I never had this experience, but I get to Mobile, Alabama, and I couldn't camp anywhere in Mobile. I had to go about 20 more miles out. Now, I've written 75 miles. Now, another 20 miles is 95 miles. I get to this place, and the place is closed. I literally was like, what the heck is going on? I've never seen a campground that is closed. They closed after certain hours because whatever. I, I never got an answer, but I had to ride another 20 miles back. And I get to a hotel, and I said, well, how much is your room? You know, I have a budget. I can't stay in a hotel 30 days, day after day. So I have to camp out because it's the cheapest. Plus, I enjoy being out in nature. And the lady says, I can't remember, $125. Now, I've been on the back and forth and 115 miles, 120 miles that day. I was tired. It was my second day on the road. I wasn't really in that shape to, to take. Usually it takes me about a week or two weeks to get really strong mentally and physically. Um, because I tell people, you know, this is very physical, but it's more mental. It's 90% mental, 10% physical. So I get to the front desk and the lady said $125 for to stay here. And I say, oh, I can't, I don't have that kind of money. Well, you can stay behind the hotel. We get up, get up at 6.30 in the morning before the owner gets here. And I did that. Just, it was always, it's never easy, right? Because, listen, I was traveling a route that was traveled by people that were enslaved. All they wanted to do was freedom, which in a way was the same thing I'm doing it. I don't, I'm not a slave. I can't compare that. But I'm looking for my own freedom, whatever that is, and I'm still asking myself every day. But I remember, and this is probably the toughest, just to answer your question, I was following a route of the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad had several routes up north to Canada, but I follow a route called, a song called um, Following the Drinking Gourd. It's actually on YouTube, read about it, listen to it. It's really a good song. It was a, a song that Africans were singing on plantations. See, they didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to, they, we didn't have GPS. So their GPS was this song. A lot of people did not, did not know that this song was actually, was singing about how to get to Canada. So the song says to follow the Tennessee River to the Ohio River, and then follow the, the North Star. That's what the song says, right? I said, oh, I'm going to follow that song. So that was the route that I followed. I stayed close to the river of the Tennessee River and the Ohio River. I wanted to feel what they felt, the hardships. So one time, I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning on the banks of the, Ohio, uh, the Tennessee River, and I'm bitten by mosquitoes. I didn't have any food. And I said, well, <laughs> this, is most, this is probably how they felt, right? And also, um, they travel at night to escape, you know, slave hunters and dogs and this and that. I'm traveling in the day. So one day I'm traveling and I'm like, again, I'm on my thoughts, right? And my thoughts are like, going all over the place, and my thought came in and says, you want the hardship? Travel at night. So for four nights, back to back, deep in Alabama, Mississippi, I travel at night. Oh, and that was so scary. 